Grace and peace, brothers and sisters. We got to talk about love. Man is to love God with all his faculties of his being. And man is to love his neighbor as himself. Let's look at it for a second. Let's look at David. 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. In 1 Samuel 18, let's take a look at David. People talk, there's many discussions about David and how he lived. But can we look at the nature in the man? First Samuel 18 and 1, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. That's real brotherhood. To love your brother as your own soul is real brotherhood. There's a standard to brotherhood that there's no betrayal. There's a standard to brotherhood of safety and security and protection as a brother. There's a standard to brotherhood where David said, let the righteous smite me, it shall be gladness. Let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil that shall not break my head because in brotherhood there must be reproof. In brotherhood they cannot be sycophants, they cannot be yes men, and if you are yes men, you are outside of the precepts and the commandment of brotherhood. He loved him as his own soul, meaning he didn't lie to his brother and tell him that good was evil or an evil was good. He didn't do that because he loved him as his own soul. And for us to love our brother as our own soul we got to be honest we got to be true we got to be sincere and we have to bear witness to the father's word and we have to care one for another he loved them as his own soul first samuel 26 21 let's take a look right here david was being persecuted by saul and chased and hunted by Saul. But let's take a look at this. First Samuel chapter 26, verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned, return my son David, for I will no more, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Hear what Saul said. Then said Saul, I have sinned, return my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Look at what he's saying here. He saw that his soul was precious in the sight of David, although he was hunting David. That David still loved him, David still treasured him. David still had thought of him lovingly. He was still dear to David, although he was hunting David for no reason. Although he was hunting David because of his ego. Although he was hunting David because of his anger. Although he was hunting David because of his hate. Although he was hunting David because of his envy. But David was still in love with him. We're looking at love that's down to the soul. Even Saul's soul was precious to David, Saul even saw it. He said, man, you're not even after me. He said, I sinned, man. He said, return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because Saul was deceived in the brotherhood to seek to do harm to David several times. He threw javelins. He moved a, a, a large amount of Israelites to go after David, and David didn't have no issue, no, no beef with Saul. They were both employees. They were both men servants. They were both called to work in the vineyard. They were both the seed of Abraham. What is the conflict? Because if you let Satan get in and you step out of the love, then you're going to move to try to do each other harm. Gossip, harm. Backbiting, harm. Whispering, harm. Slander, harm. Fornicating, harm. Envy, harm. Jealousy, harm. Berating, harm. Because Satan don't want the family to be one. We gotta be, we still have enough experience as Israelites to be the most loving people on the planet Earth because love is our legacy. 
and we're supposed to convey it. Again, we're supposed to have enough knowledge as Israelites because love is our legacy. And we're supposed to convey it. Love is our discipline and we're supposed to submit to it and live it. Love is our standard. That's why it said when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Lord shall lift up the standard against him. That's Isaiah. Isaiah 59. Why? Because you need to stand to the standard of Christ when Satan is moving against your mind to bring you into the perverted behavior or to twist the meaning of the word of God outside of the dictates and precepts of divine love. You have to lift up the standard. That's why Christ said it is written. Because let love be without dissimulation because that's how you keep the brotherhood tight. Let love be in sound doctrine. That's how you keep the brotherhood tight. That's how you love one another as your own soul. That's why you don't use, you don't feign because you love the person as your own soul. And we're not supposed to be caught up here. One generation was, the older generation was fighting with the younger generation. Look what Saul did with David. Look at the hostility. That's the first time that went down like that in Israel. That the older generation, when Israel being established in the monarchy, look what began, because these are devices of Satan to make older people fight with young people and we ain't got no beef with you. David didn't have no beef with, with Saul. David had to obey the Lord and Saul had to obey the Lord and each, their enemy was sin. Disobedience was their enemy. They were all fighting the same force. What are we doing fighting each other? We brethren. Christ said, who is my brother but them to do the will of my father? I mean, have y'all stepped into the commandment of love? Have you stepped into that ascending force? Because love is an ascending force. Love is a quickening force. No. He loved them. And he said, what did Saul say? Saul said, I, I played the fool. So when you try to harm another brother, you played the fool. When you try to set up and plot on another brother, you played the fool. When you try to sow discord, you played the fool. When you try to hurt your brother, don't you see you hurting yourself? You're playing the fool. Joseph, they played the fool. When you try to harm your brother, you play the fool. When you try to sabotage his enterprise or what he's trying to do, you play the fool. Saul saw, although he was an authority, he played the fool. Why? Because Satan wants us all to play the fool, to harm each other. That's what he wants. He wants us to play the fool by what? Sometimes, don't reprove your brother, don't say nothing. Let him keep sinning. You playing the fool. Because God said, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. I mean, you got to tell your brother to stop if you see him moving into disobedience. You're not supposed to suffer sin upon him and see the ruination of him. You're not supposed to do that. Or we play the fool. So the nation of Israel, it says the kings of the Gentiles, Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the people of Israel crucified Christ played the fool. Love harmed. Beauty harmed. Playing the fool. Now we got to be wise. When Saul went and dealt with the witchcraft, he played the fool. Why are you playing the fool? Because God told you don't do that. That's being naughty. When you, how is a person naughty? Naughty is when you know you shouldn't do it and you do it anyway. That's a naughty child. The child know they shouldn't behave that way, but they're doing it anyway. My parents not going to beat me because my parents love me. That's naughty. My parents not going to beat me because I'm the firstborn. That's naughty. My parents not going to beat me because it's my birthday. That's naughty. My parents not going to beat me because I'm, I'm their favorite. That's naughty. Because look at the damage you're causing. Brother says, we can't play the fool. We done. We in captivity now for playing the fool. Now, let's go over here. Second Samuel is one twenty-six. Second Samuel chapter one. Verse twenty-six. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful. You hearing what he's saying here? When Jonathan died, he said, I'm distressed, man, it hurt. Because that's what love does. When the relationship ends, it hurts. 
I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant has thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. This is how brothers are supposed to be. The love that brothers are supposed to have for each other, the love that brothers are supposed to have for each other, the love is supposed to be wonderful. That's what God is saying. These are all revelations of the father's character. These are all the revelations of brotherhood. So before David came into the seat of authority, he saw a love that was what? Wonderful. Although Joab, his cousin, was not in that love with him like that. Jonathan was. So God is showing us a standard that the love that brothers are supposed to have with each other, the love is supposed to be what? Wonderful, protective, honest, true, sure, just, kind, gentle, and very pleasant. The love is supposed to be what? Wonderful. The greatest commandment. The shepherd is giving direction to the sheep. The shepherd is leading us to green pastures. We have to pasture in holiness. We have to pasture in love. We have to pasture in sanctification. We have to pasture in discipline. We have to pasture in regeneration. We have to pasture in virtue. We have to pasture in gentleness. We have to pasture in goodness. We have to pasture in temperance. We have to pasture in the great commandment. We must pasture in love. We're in the time of reformation. God has commanded Christ to make the new covenant and it's been made. There's changes being made for the better. So brothers and sisters, we got to change. We need to go here to Ecclesiastes 30, 23. Do you love your own soul? Because God loves us to the soul. We saw that David loved Jonathan as his own soul and the love was wonderful. So brothers, y'all have a standard of brotherhood to aspire to the love got to be pleasant and the love got to be holy and the love got to be wonderful. The love got to be protective. The love got to be true. The love got to be wonderful. The love got to be disciplined. The love got to be gentle. The love got to be inspiring. The love got to be wonderful. The love got to be faithful. The love got to be sure. The love got to be certain. The love got to be wonderful. The love got to be holy. The love got to correct. But the love got to be wonderful. The love got to be pleasant. He said, I'm distressed for thee, Jonathan. Meaning, some love, when you experience it, is so beautiful, you don't never want it to end. That is where Christ said the brotherhood in Christ must be. A love without end. But what ends love? Sin. What ends love? Hate. What ends love? Envy. What ends love? Jealousy. What ends love? When you're, not, when you're seeking your own instead of the wealth of another that ends love. Greed ends love. Ego ends love. Brutality ends love. Lack of humility ends love. Lack of every joint supply. If we don't honor one another, that's to the end of love. Christ said, let brotherly love continue. This is his commandment. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. I mean, he showed us the ascending, the ascending, the ascending. And we got to respect the word of love. The time, brothers and sisters, is a time of love. But in the time of love that God told Israel about in Ezekiel 16, he said, I covered your nakedness. It's a time to be covered. 
a time to be adorned. It's a time to put on your dignity. It's a time to be stately. It's a time to be noble. It's a time to move according to the prescribed rules of conduct because God said he beheld their manners in the wilderness. Because in a time of love, it's not a time of recklessness. In a time of love, we can't use grace as an occasion to the flesh to walk in lasciviousness because we're not respecting the time of love. Ecclesiastes 30, 23. In a time of love is a time of nurturing. In a time of love is a time of what? Education. Because the Father is opening up the spiritual realm for us to come into, as it says in Peter's, that we may come into life and godliness. Ephesians says all things that pertain, all prudence and all wisdom. Peter said spiritual blessings in the time of love. This is where you transform. So are we going to observe the opportunity and beware of the evil? Ecclesiastes 30 verse 23 Love thine own soul and comfort thy heart remove sorrow far from it for sorrow hath killed many and there is no profit therein envy and wrath shorten the life envy and wrath shorten the life so God said love your own soul but why did he mention envy and wrath shorten the life it's like a tourniquet it shuts down your blood supply it makes you depressed because instead of admiring what's happening for your brother, you're envying him. Satan envied the prospect of Adam's glory and his love that God was going to bestow upon him. So he misguided him. He deceived his wife, showing you when people envy you, they're going to try to get into the ear of your wife. Because they envy you. That's what Satan did. Because they want to create disruption in your relationship. That's what Satan did. Because the God says, sit not at all with another man's wife. And if you have to speak to a brother's wife, it has to be total transparency. Because we cannot be ignorant of Satan's devices. He is the author of all chaos and confusion. So again, Ecclesiastes 30, 23, love thine own soul and comfort thy heart. So in loving your own soul, you have to know what's good for your soul. Grudges is not good for our soul. Bitterness is not good for our soul. Disobedience is not good for our soul. Deceit is not good for our soul. Not being honest about what happened, our own shortcomings, is not good for our soul. If we deceive ourselves, that's not good for our soul. The lust of the flesh is not good for our soul. Um, bitterness, it's not good for our soul. Grudges, not good for our soul. Um, what's good for our soul? Only beauty and love and holiness and kindness and equity and fairness and gentleness and justice and sanctification those are the good things for your soul so we got to treasure our soul and treasure the relationship and stand in that beauty and love thine own soul in us loving our soul we have to be disciplined we have to what, what did paul say in the love of his own soul he said i kept under my body and brought it into subjection lest when i preach to others i myself become a reprobate See, because he was the, is in love of his own soul, so he kept under his body. He did not let the lusts of the flesh and the passions and the desires rule over him, no. There's some people that want to rule a city, but they can't rule their own spirit. They can't rule their own lust. They can't rule their own anger, but they're celebrated and they applaud them because he took down a city, but he couldn't take down his malice. He couldn't take down his anger. He couldn't take down his, his, his inconsistency, his incontinence. But everybody celebrates him in the city. But he couldn't rule his own spirit. That's why God said, love your own soul. So when us loving our own soul, what must we do? We got to eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood. Man must, live, must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Because that's the nurturing, that's the food we need for our own soul. Okay. Envy and wrath shorten the life. Envy and wrath creates depression. Envy and wrath makes you feel what? Uneasy in your temple. So beware of envy. Beware of wrath. It says wrath is cruel. Cruel. 
and anger is outrageous, but who can stand before envy? Because if you look at what's going on in somebody's life and you resent what God is doing, what you're doing, you don't know you're channeling Satan's spirit. Instead of admiring the brother and aiding them in their growth, you step into the envy or the envy of your sister or the envy of any good. Envy is only related to some good you're seeing somebody else enjoying and you're not in it. Or you think it's only for you, which is jealousy. What the envy does, it shortens your life because envy puts you, is a forward thinking spirit against what God is doing in a person's life. Now, Ecclesiastes 7.23, let's go here. So love your own soul, so don't be part of that. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 21, let thy soul love a good servant and defraud him not of liberty. So God is to let your soul love a good servant and defraud him not of his liberty. We are all Christ's servants. Men servants or women servants. But it's to let your soul love a good servant. If somebody's coming to help you and God sends somebody to help you, look what God has shown you. Don't be proud. Don't be arrogant. Don't be egotistical. Don't think you're better. Don't be patronizing. Don't be belittling. Don't be disparaging. Don't be discrediting. Don't invalidate what they're doing. What did God has shown you? He's shown you the king's majesty. He's to let your soul love. Look at this here. A good servant. Somebody that was good to you and aided you and supported you, he said the bond is supposed to be so tight, it's supposed to be a bond to the soul. So even in America, in this country, and what the British did and the English did, and what the Esau did and the Europeans did, they abused people that were good servants. They took credit for their inventions, they took credit for their work, they took credit for their abilities, they took credit for their talents because they envied a good servant instead of their soul loving a good servant. There's one that bears rule over another to their own hurt because it's what spirit you are in with each other. What spirit we're in with each other determines what eternally our reward. Who would understand it? Let, let thy soul love a good servant. Showing us that how you're supposed to care for, for somebody that's helping you and aiding you and advocating for you and supporting you. Your soul is supposed to love them. It's supposed to be a wonderful, pleasant relationship. Wisdom of Solomon 11. The greatest commandment. Christ is showing us what he wants us to do. How we should live. The rising. With Psalm 11 verse 22. For the whole world before thee is as a little grain of the balance. Yea, as a drop of the morning dew that falleth down upon the earth. The whole earth before God is as a grain of a balance. And the drop of a morning dew that falleth upon the earth. Meaning... It's so small. So why, how can we be proud against each other? It's so small. <laughs> how can one brother think I'm better than the other person? No, it's so small. So David said, I'm like a vapor. But what is God showing you? In that smallness, he's looking, focusing, zooming. He's in care and in concern with us. He's loving us and he's valuing us and he's treasuring us. So meaning God is treasuring the earth, but the earth is so small, but he's treasuring us and he's valuing us and he sent his son to die for us. So how are you looking down upon somebody instead of treasuring them? Because God is high and lifted up. But he looks at what's small and he values it and he treasures it and he adorns it and determined to beautify it and he makes plans to, to increase it and to enrich it and to beautify it. Look at the divine mind. But thou hast mercy upon all for thou canst do all things and winkest at the sins of men because they should amend. So God has mercy upon all but he said he winks at the sins of men that they should amend. So the mercy is a winking. But the winking is for us to change. Because we're not getting away with it. We are giving time to change. To stop it. To what? Be reformed. Now, for thou lovest all things that are and abhorrest nothing which thou hast made. For never wouldest thou have made anything if thou hadst hated it. So God said, 
Wait a minute, he loves all things that are. God says he loves all of us. So in John 3, 16, when it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, because believing in Christ Jesus is a direction for life. Believing in Christ Jesus is a direction for thinking. Believing in Christ Jesus is a way of living. Believing in Christ Jesus is a commandment to change. Believing in Christ Jesus is a revolution of your life and a change of your direction. So whosoever believeth in him should not perish for what they're doing and what they have done but have everlasting life because they're going to be new creatures they're going to put off the old man and put on a new man for thou lovest all things that are for neither and abhorrest nothing which thou hast made for never wouldest thou have made anything if thou hatest it so when a person comes into God hatred is for what they're doing because God hates evil so if anybody want to get into God's hatred, if you do evil, now you're entering into the hatred of God. For how could anything have endured if thou hadst, if it had not been thy will, or been preserved, if not called by thee, but thou sparest all? For they are thine, O Lord, thou lover of soul. So God is sparing us all, because he's a lover of soul, and he winks at our sins that we should do what? That we should amend. So if you sow discord in brotherhood, you have to fix the brotherhood. If you destroyed marriages, you got to fix marriages. Yeah, this is real. Is if the wicked restore the pledge, you got to give again that which is robbed and can, can not commit iniquity, meaning you got to clean up the damage you done. Because God wants us to amend. It must be a total reversal of our conduct. So we have to go from disobedience into obedience. So let's go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. This is my commandment. No, Christ is not doing what anybody said. No. The prophet shall the Lord thy God raise up unto thee like unto me. That's what Moses said. Him shall you hear. I Meaning he's giving us a direction for life. 1 John 3, verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So love is not without standards. Love is not without discipline. Love is not without responsibility. Love is not without dictates. Love is not without precepts of life. Love is not without obligations and duties. They are. They are. Obligation, duty. Read the New Testament. It's plain. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So, Cain saw that his brother was in the discipline of the faith. Cain saw his brother was obeying what God said. And look how Cain responded. He was angry. Look how Cain responded. He was wrathful. Look at how Cain responded. He was resentful. And his resentment brought him into killing his brother that was in obedience. Showing you where the carnal mind is at. So while you were in obedience, like the disciples were in obedience, the Pharisees, the scribes, where were they doing? The chief priests, the lawyers, they were plotting to kill them. Disobedience is trying to kill those that are in obedience. They that are born after the flesh hates them that are born after the spirit. They that are living undisciplined life hate men that have submitted to the fear of God and submitted to the righteousness of Christ and are trying to be new creatures and are endeavoring and striving to enter into the straight gate, Cain is hating Abel because of what? Because of the spirit of sin that he's in. Because some people are hearing the message of love and some people don't value it. Some people hear what God is pleased with and some people are making excuses because Cain knew what God said but he was not his brother's keeper. He didn't care because he was not about no relationship. So why did he kill his brother? Because he didn't value his brother. Again, why did he kill his brother? Because he didn't value his brother. Because the satanic spirit is not for you to, it's for you not to value your brother, not to treasure his life. Because you don't like that God gave him life in the first place. You don't like that you're not in control of him. So since Cain could not persuade Abel to join him in his disobedience, he killed him. That's why they killed Stephen. That's why they killed our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they killed the prophets. 
That's why they kill or hate righteous people, which is people that, have, that, that are submitted to the will of God because the spirit of Cain is operating in this earth because Cain don't want to submit to the message. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Showing you the hostility is an abiding in death. The backbiting and the whispering is an abiding in death. So we run over here to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. As a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 19 again. Think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things dearly beloved for your edifying. So Paul was speaking to the Corinthians to correct their behavior because although they were loved, the entire book of Corinthians was dealing with the issues of their behavior as the beloved. So in the New Testament, God is correcting the behavior of them that love him and them that are loved by him. Rather, God is correcting the behavior of them that are loved by him in the book of Corinthians and in the epistles, the behavior of the beloved saints and the children of God is being corrected. He said, we do all these things for your edifying to instruct and improve you, especially spiritually and morally to enlighten you spiritually and morally to change your behavior in the way you think. To give spiritual insight to you and deep understanding and to brighten you up. So their behavior was inconsistent with obedience to the gospel because they were what, carnal? They were babes. They did not grow up unto him. They needed to be brightened up. They were in disobedience. They still had imaginations of how they think it should be and did not bring into captivity every thought to obedience of Christ because in a marriage, the bride must obey the husband. And we as the church of Christ must be in the obedience of Christ because there's a strictness to the marriage covenant. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates. Envyings, see? Because debates and envyings is all satanic and spiritual attacks. They were under attack. These are acts of war. Debates, envyings, wraths, strife, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, and tumults. So though people think that it's ordinary human behavior, that's in the earthly realm. But if you put it under the CAT scan, if you put it under the spiritual MRI, if you zoom in and see it, you will see that debates and envying and wrath and strife contending for superiority, I'm better, I'm more superior to that person, they're beneath me, we above, backbiting, talking behind each other's back instead of reconciling, backbiting, whisperings and swellings and tumults, these are all acts of war. These are all weapons of Satan's warfare being deployed that the, the saints must understand that you should not bite and devour each other. This is all biting and devouring. This is all what? Raising it, raising it to the foundation thereof. These are all acts of sledgehammers against the temples of God. Debates, envyings, wrath, strife, backbiting, whispering. So gossip is an act of war. You gotta know that. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I shall be well many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Showing you all these spirits, debate, envying, wrath, strife, backbiting, whispering, swellings, tumults is all what? Uncleanness lasciviousness and fornicating spirits that's what it is and God is calling us what to be clean God is calling us to be risen and God is calling us to operate where in the message of the commandment again let's go back to first John chapter 3 verse 14 we know that we have passed from death unto life because we just read about death Debates, wraths, strife, backbiting, swelling, tumults, whisperings, fornication is all death. 
Those are the acts of death. So when you pass from death unto life, you in a more divine, loving nature. Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer. Because why they can't hate his brother? Because his brother did not partake of his works. And that's where hatred amongst men lies in the divine realm of examination because you don't agree with their behavior and you don't want to partake with what they're doing. But the scripture said we were sometimes darkness, now we're light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. We can't be partakers of them anymore once you repent. And what men do because you don't want to partake of their sinful ways, they will hate you. They will cast you out of their company instead of considering that they need to stop what they're doing also. Why did Cain kill Abel? And and because Cain did not receive the message that you got to change, Cain. It's here in First John because it's showing you about the obstinate, stiff-necked nature that man will continue in destructive behavior even though God is giving him time to amend. And when you amend and when you make the change, they will hate you. Marvel not the world hates you. Marvel not the world hates you when you repent. Marvel not the world world hates you when you change. Marvel not the world hates you when you not a, you don't run with them to the same excess of rioting. Marvel not the world hates you if you don't backbite, if you don't whisper, if you don't you're not in swellings and you're not in tumults and you're not walking in the pride of this life and acting superior and you're not for dishonest gain. Marvel not if the world hates you that you don't continue with them in their wickedness. Marvel not the world hates you if you don't operate in wrath and envyings because the world is in those spirits Mod of the world hates you if you don't operate in uncleanness and lasciviousness and fornication because the world gonna hate you when you step away from it you think you better no I fear God you think you better no we are better than these sinful ways that's being put upon the earth we are better Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So this is where the murdering spirit, character assassination spirit, um, the smear campaign spirit, the I don't want to talk to you spirit, and God said, let's reason together. Why is the murdering spirit there? Because if they can't persuade you to join them in their lascivious behavior and their sinful behavior, they want to murder you. That's what they do. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and see if his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So you have the world good and you see your brother have need and you shut up your bowels of compassion from him. God said, he said, how, how dwelleth the love of God in you? Because what God is showing you, you're supposed to be not seeking your own wealth, but the wealth of another. There are brothers that are in position that know other men work in the same trade that they in, but they got it on hush. They don't want to share the information. They don't want to share the knowledge about the trade so the brother can increase his salary and better provide for his family. That's wickedness. That's evil. That's what it's showing you. you disobeying the message. You're supposed to not seek your own wealth, but the wealth of another. You're supposed to see the commonwealth of Israel. Christ did not withhold the knowledge of eternal life from us. He shared the knowledge so we could partake of the benefit. So brothers and sisters, you're supposed to share knowledge with each other so that other brothers and sisters can partake of the benefit that you're partaking of. Those of you that are in similar trades and work. That's what you're supposed to do. And if you don't, it says, how dwelleth the love of God in you? How you shut up the bowels of compassion, showing you this selfishness, that's why there's not sharing of knowledge and information and goods. Because some, sometimes the goods in this world is information. How you a family you don't share information with other believers? Do you know that the believer, that brother is loved by God? So we should agree with each other. Being loved by God. I agree with you being loved by God, brother. I agree with you being loved by God, sister. I agree with your children being loved by God. Let's just purify ourselves even as he is pure. Let's purify ourselves even as God is pure. Because God set the love upon us. 
But how did John have to address this behavior? Because Satan was trying to shut down the love in the earth. Because where the love is, there's the magic of life. There it is. Okay. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. So the commandment is the authoritative order and the important rule of law given by God Almighty declaring to the people how they should behave in a forceful way. So there's a force to the love. Is it, there's a force to the love to move you beyond the tension into the beauty of the love. God is forcing us in love because the prince of the power of the air is forcing people into hatred, into envy, into wrath, into strife. So God is pressing us into the kingdom of love. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. There it is again. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor, not in lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. So if a man is operating in fornication, God is saying, you don't know me. But it's time to get to know God. When we were enemies, we were, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. God wanted us to know about holy living, covenant living, kingdom living, just living, responsible living, upright living, character living, noble living, dignified living, integrity living, Christ-like living, godly living. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. So why would a man defraud his brother? Because he's dealing with competition. He wants the brother not to have something that he worked for. So he's trying to cheat him out of it. He's trying to trick him. He's trying to deceive him. He's trying to manipulate him. For God has not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despise him, despise him not man, but God who hath also given us his Holy Spirit. So the despising deals with this, that you don't want the brother to have that. You don't feel that he's worthy. He's entitled. And in many cases, people are angry with other people's spiritual gifts. Other people knacks and talents. Instead of by love, let's work with each other and benefit each other. Is it he there for the despiseth, despiseth, not man but God? So what God is showing here, if you move into the despising of a brother or sister in your own carnal mind, of fornication, lasciviousness, uncleanness. God is saying you despise God. You despise that God gave the person life and you despise what God is doing in the person. The person was not injurious to you. The person was not a thief. The person was not a mur murderer. The person did not fornicate against you or fornicate. No, you know, so why are you despising them? You don't know that you under a satanic mask and a satanic lock. And this is what people have to stop now. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So we taught to love one another. But fornication and uncleanness is out. So you're dealing with families, fathers loving their children, mothers loving their children, children loving other children, brothers loving other brothers, love flowing. Because we have been given in the gospel of Christ the legacy to continue Christ's love and God's love in this earth. Let us walk accordingly. Let us keep ourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord unto eternal life. Again, John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. So in that love there are duties, in that love there's responsibilities, in that love there's no fornication, in that love there's no whoremongering, in that love there's no jesting, in that love there's no backbiting, no whispering, no swellings, no tumults, in that love there's holiness, in that love there's no covetousness, 
In that love, there's no idolatry. In that love, there's a disciplined life. In that love, there's an enriching. In that love, we treasuring each, each other. In that love, you loving your brother as your own soul. And if you love someone as your own soul, then you're going to care for them. You're going to be gentle. You're going to be kind. You're going to be thoughtful. You're going to be temperate. You're going to be lowly. You're going to be meek. You're going to be true. You're going to be sincere. You're going to value one another. Love one another as I have loved you. Meaning we should value each other. And in the valuing of each other, we have to tell each other the truth when we are wrong in the word of the gospel of Christ. Because you cannot share the unclean spirit of lies with each other. You have to share the spirit of truth and wholeness one with another. So we can increase and abound in love one towards another. As it said in, in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that ye may approve things that are excellent that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God so our love must abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment to make the right decisions in life. That we may approve what's excellent. So God is calling you to excellence. So love is a calling to an excellent spirit and an excellent mind. It's that a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. But a prince that wanteth understanding is often a great oppressor. So we got to pick. A prince that wanteth understanding is a great oppressor. He's intimidating, he's cruel, he's mean, but it says that a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. And of an excellent spirit, you are proving what's excellent, you're bearing witness to what Christ said, because Paul said that he wanted to deal with the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord. When God calls us to walk in the beauty of his love, the commandments are not grievous. So the commandments to live as Christ told us to live, brothers and sisters, is not oppressive. Don't let nobody deceive you. It's beautiful, it's excellent, it's enriching, it's reviving, and it's miraculous. So you, brothers and sisters, live the beauty of the love. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Christ had to correct Peter when he was speaking outside the gospel. Paul had to correct Peter. So even, even when you're anointed, even when you're loved, in the love of God, there is correction when you speak outside of the honor of his majesty, the king. May we love one another as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice and a sweet smelling savor unto God but fornication and all uncleanness and lasciviousness and bickering and whispering. Let it not be once named among us that are operating in the spirit and called to be saints, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, because it's not convenient. But let's deal with the giving of thanks. We thank the Father for loving us and call us, calling us in the great commandment because in the great commandment is the great force of love. May that force dominate your life. May that force beautify your life. Again, in the commandment of love is a force to life and vitality and reviving where God said this is the refreshing. May you be refreshed by love. May you be refreshed by beauty. May you be refreshed by gentleness. May you be refreshed by enlightenment. May you be refreshed by the knowledge of the Son of God Jesus Christ our Lord, may you live in love. I'm going to say grace and peace to you brothers and sisters and thank you for your time. And thank you for us talking about the great commandment that we should love one another. Let's treasure each other and walk in the discipline of Christ. Walk in the discipline of life. Walk as brides. Walk as them that belong to the Lamb. Walk as the chaste virgins. Walk in love as God so loved us. If you were touched by the message, send an email. Yes, you can. Risen with Christ Ministries at gmail.com. Born again Israelite at gmail.com. Every Tuesday, 7:30 to 9, there's a conference call. 712-432-0075. Access code 739-720. You can call with your questions or your comments or your good feedback. But remember, it's of after a godly sort. We don't deal with debates. We don't deal with strife. We don't deal with tumults. We only deal with the conversation of the beauty of love. So let's walk in that nobility. Let's exhort one another and let's live and carry on the legacy of love, the legacy of faith. Let's walk in the faith in our generation and walk 
walk in the beauty of the gospel of Christ to the glory of God our Father until he comes. Grace and peace. A very special thank you to you brothers and sisters that are supporting the ministry. And we ask you to join us on Tuesdays, 7.30 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a conference call if you have any questions. And subscribe to the YouTube channels Risen with Christ on YouTube Ministries and Born Again Israelite Ministries. The Lord bless you and keep you and let your light shine. Eat Christ's flesh, drink his blood, and live the glory of his majesty, walking in the divine love, walking in the freedom that is in Christ Jesus.